Welcome to KAUST Live. I'm with John Kolb. He is the VP and Chief Information Officer at Rensselaer University. Uh, I'm sorry, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I apologize. So, John, tell us what the Chief Information Officer's role at Rensselaer is. What's your day-to-day -day life like there? Besides getting in everybody's way all the time? Uh, <laughs> um, well, I, as the uh, CIO, I report to the president at uh, Rensselaer, and uh, uh, I have all the administrative and academic computing units, including our supercomputer, uh, our libraries, and uh, w one of the things I always love is I have an experimental machine shop, uh, so I have the biggest hammers on campus if nothing else works to get everything in line. So. Uh, uh, it's, but it's mostly uh, working with our researchers and our uh, business units to uh, uh, make things more efficient or push the boundaries on things and so on and have a, just a terrific staff that uh, helps get that done all the time. Um, the university's tagline is, why not change the world? Can you talk a little bit about uh, how IT and you know, supercomputing infrastructure and that sort of thing is, is helping you guys fulfill that mission? Sure. I mean, we we want to challenge our uh, students to uh, think about seriously. How do you go about changing the world? You know, how do you be a leader? How do you use uh, some of the tools that we we help uh, give you while you're there? Uh, and the first and foremost piece is, uh, like Cast, we just have great students, and uh, and you have good raw material. It's nice to, to to help them see what sort of impact that they can make on the the world and. IT tools uh, are certainly a way that uh, the world is changing. Uh, being able to bring uh, different technologies to bear on the different types of problems that are around in the world, whether it's environmental problems, social problems, engineering problems. And uh, uh, we, we try to challenge our students the entire time that they're with us to uh, not only use IT tools, but in particular, since you asked that question, uh, how do they use those tools? So for instance, all of our undergraduates are required to have a laptop, and that laptop is chock full of all sorts of software to take on sorts of uh, problems, whether they're engineering problems and using tools, uh, systems tools, or they could be uh, mathematics problems and using uh, symbolic algebra tools or that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. so we try to give them a, a, a good uh, uh, start with uh, those sorts of things that they can build from there. Any um, sort of big highlights that, that come to mind when you think about uh, examples of, of research that's going on on campus that is exciting or that uh, maybe even highlights some of these, uh, you know, I IT infrastructure investments you guys have made? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, we have a, a project that at, at first blush is more of an environmental biological problem. Uh, and it may have some applicability and um, some similarities to what you're doing with the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, but near, near the campus, about uh, an hour north of us, is a 36-mile long lake called Lake George. It has some of the best uh, water in the world in terms of clarity and, uh, and you can drink right out of the lake and so on. And, uh, Thomas Jefferson called it the, the most beautiful lake he ever saw in his life. And so we named a project called the Jefferson Project to under, really understand the lake at a much different level. We've partnered with IBM and a group called the Fund for Lake George. And we've now instrumented that lake with uh, all sorts of things to, to look at the entire watershed, uh, monitor the weather uh, in a number of places, look at the, uh, the water that's coming down the watershed into the lake monitor the lake uh, in terms of uh, water chemistry, currents, uh, other things, and bring that all back. And now all of a sudden it becomes a big data problem. Uh, and how do you use that information to uh, help inform uh, policymakers and others in terms of what they can do or not do? And, uh, and it's interesting, the science has suggested a, a few things that are a little different than uh, perhaps what people may have done uh, first blush there. So. Uh, uh, it's a research project, but with any research project, we get our not only grad students involved, but undergraduates involved mm -hmm. in a project like that. Um, so that's a, one example. Uh, another one that may be of interest here and is, is more of a, an IT project is uh, something we call our Cognitive and Immersive Systems Laboratory, where we're 
bringing together cognitive tools. Uh, uh, this is another project with uh, it just happens to be with IBM, but we're so we're working with Watson and uh, um, and uh, bringing it into something called our experimental media and performing arts center, where mm -hmm. we have. Uh, some environments where we can control the sound and the sight and so on, make it a uh, very immersive environment, uh, and then bring cognitive agents on top of that. So you can be there and say, I want to work on some problem, and my cognitive agent is there going to get background material for for me and for the group as we go uh, do something like that. Uh, very, very interesting in terms of the group dynamics, of uh, people to people, people to cognitive agents, cognitive agents to people, and how do you make all that work? And uh, uh, that's a blast, and once again, has graduate students and undergraduate students involved in it. So then how are you, for both of those projects and, and any of the others, how are you guys solving your, your big data problem? What's, what's, the, what's the solution that, that Rensselaer's uh, sort of going for? Um, so, so two things. One is we have a uh, supercomputer on the campus. We have a, a it's a petaflop machine, uh, uh, which I don't know how technical your audience is. So that's a quadrillion uh, calculations per second. Um, so I usually say that it's uh, it's on the order of about 150,000 calculations per person per second per person in the world per second. Um, and so when you have that kind of computational power, we have some large storage behind it, but then that allows us to reduce information to something more manageable uh, if we know how we want to get that done at that point. Um, and we also have one of the only instances outside of uh, IBM with a, a Watson. We have an instance of Watson, Watson, Watson on campus, and, uh, and so we're using uh, cognitive tools uh, like that to help sort through the data and so on and uh, and uh, you know you can go out and do a search but then say okay Watson figure out how to reduce this down to something I can really take a look at and so on and, right. and so on. Um, you've been in pretty much every position of leadership uh, reading through your, your <laughs> CV in an academic institution so you, you, you obviously have a unique perspective on how uh, IT in particular or supercomputing can sort of support students, can support research. Any any other thoughts to add in, in that sort of realm? Well, it's interesting. I, uh, I started in a computing graphics uh, center, mm -hmm. a research center, and I uh, and then uh, I actually ran our core engineering program for five years. So I, the all undergraduates take the core engineering program in the engineering school. And so uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting kind of weird zig in my career uh, to do that but then I uh, and as I was getting into that the book on me was this computing guy wants to do curriculum and what does he know about curriculum and five years later I applied to be the dean of computing and uh, the book on me was this curriculum guy wants to do computing what does he know about computing and and so it's funny how we can all get pigeonholed in our, our various institutions but uh, what that allowed me to understand is really curriculum at a very deep level in terms of what we were trying to do. We actually changed the core curriculum quite a bit while I was there. And uh, it gave me an appreciation for really listening to what the faculty were trying to accomplish mm -hmm. and what their goals were and how could we help ac accommodate that. And uh, that served me well on the computing side. I, I work, for instance, very closely with both the provost and the VP of research now. And uh, uh, we'll work on projects where I have some IT expertise, but our VP of research, for instance, is a chemist, uh, a biotechnology type of person. And mm -hmm. so I've learned a lot from him about biotechnology and then how do we apply uh, information tools to uh, doing better biotechnology. Right. Does any of that uh, fit into, I guess, what's been termed the, the Rensselaer plan? And, uh, and if it does, are there any lessons? Um, you know, we're always asking what lessons are out there for emerging universities. Um, well, one of the things about our president is she, and she had the ground running. She started in 1999, spent the first year putting this plan together, mm -hmm and had it unanimously approved by her board uh, before a year was up. And that's just, you know, some presidents come and spend five years trying to get to know everybody. She's right off to the, the races in terms of how to put that together. And 
um, the plan has been really our blueprint. And uh, it's quite unique for higher ed, I think, because it's not just a plan that's sitting on the shelf. It's a plan that we work our, uh, we work to all the time. And so we uh, did a version 2.0 of, of the plan a couple years ago. We called it the Rensselaer Plan 2024. Mm -hmm. um, every year we go through uh, every, what we call portfolios on the campus. We review their operational plans to the overall Rensselaer Plan and our year uh, you know, and I'm asked all the time, are the priorities within uh, .CIO, which is our division, division of the chief information officer, uh, are we, uh, is our operational plan meeting the expectations of the Rensselaer plan and the other portfolios as they put their plans together? So I have a whole crosswalk in my plan of this is what HR is trying to do, this is what the School of Engineering is trying to do, this is what the experimental media group is trying to do, and so on. And uh, uh, and how are we going to accommodate that? Right, very good. Well, John Kolb, this is all the time that we have for today. Okay. I appreciate uh, your coming by and talking with us. I hope you enjoy the rest of your time at KAUST, and uh, thank you for sitting down. Well, Nick, thank you. This has been great. I've really enjoyed being here at KAUST. So. Great. Much appreciated. Thank you.